Thank you so much. Thank you for, for uh, to Medica for setting this up. And thank you for everybody who's who's um, listening and watching this. I really, really appreciate it. And so our focus today is going to be on hemoparineum, specifically as a cause of, um, as a sequela of, of splenic masses. And you've already heard my background. For those of you who don't don't know me, uh, I currently operate by triage full time, but spend a, a good amount of time throughout the year giving talks, uh, giving surgical talks. So this will be our outline. The If you haven't received the proceedings yet, um, uh, when you do receive the proceedings, they, those notes go into a lot of detail uh, to the point where it's almost academic, but uh, that those proceedings will have way more information than we'll talk about here. The goal here with this, with this discussion is to make this as practical and clinical as possible so you can actually utilize this in your practice. Even if you don't perform splenectomies, it's, it's still that initial client interaction diagnostic workup is paramount. But those proceedings have a lot more notes, a lot more detail than we'll go into here today. So this is our outline. We'll start with some anatomy and function of the spleen. We'll talk about the incidence of splenic masses, the uh, pathogenesis of such masses. What can you expect as far as signaling clinical signs? What sort of diagnostics are you going to perform? How to stabilize the patients? treatment options, and of course, focusing on surgery. After surgery, we've got post-operative outcomes, complications, predictive factors, prognostic factors, some final key points, and any questions that uh, folks folks may have. In brief, the anatomy of the spleen is well known to a lot of us veterinarians. The picture there on the left with the dog is a little bit misleading. If you can see the spleen is sandwiched between the stomach and the kidney there, which is a, not entirely true. The spleen um, actually is quite mobile and can vary in its shape. This is important when you're collecting radiographs to evaluate the spleen. It will silhouette with the liver and surrounding soft tissues. And because it can vary in size and positioning, it can cause some confusion with veterinarians in terms of how to interpret or over-interpret the radiographs. Um, obviously, abdominal ultrasound gives you a lot more detail in that regard. But just so we're all aware, the spleen can change in uh, shape, size, and location quite often. And then on the on the right side, we have the uh, a gross depiction of the spleen as well as its vascular supply. So the short gastrics, the left left gastric aploic, the splenic, and then um, those that 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 feed from the to and from the omentum. And so this is the typical vascular supply of the spleen. This is, of course, imperative because if the spleen gets involved in a gastric dilatation and volvulus, for example, the short gastric arteries and veins are typically ruptured or splenic torsion, the vascular supply matters. Most importantly to us, most commonly is going to be splenectomy. The goal here is to ligate the pedicles. And so you need to know the anatomy to some degree. In a situation where the spleen becomes congested because of a GDV, or splenic torsion, of course, or even um, um, uh, aggressive cancers, the vasculature may not be as straightforward as these pictures depict, but as far as knowing the basic anatomy of the spleen, this is vital. And another drawing there regarding the vascular supply of the spleen and, um, and, and all different branches. And the other point of this too, is if you notice the proximity of the stomach and the pancreas to the spleen, you don't want to compromise the pancreas and stomach's blood supply when you're removing the spleen. And so the uh, knowledge of this anatomy is also vital for that reason. I will say, because when you are typically removing the spleen, you're not necessarily going for margins. You're trying to remove the entire spleen, and that's that. The safest thing to do as a surgeon is to stay alongside the spleen, and you're not even worried about compromising pancreatic or gastric blood flow because you can you can stay right alongside this, the vascular side of the, of the spleen and ligate all those pedicles. Going into more anatomy regarding the spleen, um, I wanna remind folks that it is a very complex organ that functions as an immune system, uh, not just, not just uh, um, blood supply and or, or uh, um, hemostatic. And so these are just the depictions of the um, important structures of the spleen on a microscopic level. The spleen is a very important immune organ, and it is responsible for white blood cells, producing antibodies, and immunoregulation, immunosurveillance, all that good stuff. Very important for the spleen. 
you can see the picture of the red blood cell, which is what we typically think of splenic function as a, a source of blood supply in, in animals that are, for example, suddenly anemic, splenic contraction helps uh, contribute to the red blood cell mass of that patient, but it also has other functions regarding the immune system. And then that, that, that cytology picture there with the big arrow, that's a platelet. And so don't forget, of course, the spleen does provide a reservoir for platelets also. So, so the spleen is a very important organ in multiple facets, not just as a blood storage organ. Now let's go into the incidence of splenic lesions and specifically focusing on cancer, but of course, cancer is not the only thing that can affect the spleen. In terms of some st statistics here, between 0.3 to 2% of all neoplasia in dogs over eight years of age comes from the spleen. So it's uh, quite a common one in clinical practice, especially as a specialist, we will see a lot of splenic masses referred over to us. The um, splenic neoplasia makes up 5% of all non-skin primary malignant cancers in large breed dogs. In cases of splenic lesions, neoplasia is found somewhere between 48 and 66% of cases, unclassified in 0.4%, not neoplastic in 34 to 55% of cases, Overall, if you're speaking to a pet owner, you can quote them these numbers. The overall malignancy incidence of, of splenic cancer is about 76%, benign 24%. Keep in mind, I'm going to stress this as I do stress it in the proceedings. These numbers are highly variable. As you can see, there's wide ranges. And that's because every study is different in terms of how they're monitoring, how they're keeping track, collecting their data for splenic lesions in dogs. It, it, it causes a lot of uh, confusion um, and intense interpretation of these papers. So I tried my best to consolidate these papers into numbers you can actually use. So in general, three quarters of dogs with a splenic mass will have cancer and about 25%, one quarter of dogs will, will have benign disease. The overall incidence of splenic neoplasia, 33 to 66%, 80% being malignant, benign 20, 10%. And again, you can already see there's variation in these percentages from the last slide because it's tough to try and consolidate these. But in general, um, 75 to 80% uh, malignancy rate, which is very high, of course. Of the malignancy, between 50 and 90% will be hemangiosarcoma. No surprise there. Overall, hemangiosarcoma is found in 65 to 88% of affected dogs. Splenic hemangiosarcoma associated with a hemoperineum, 76% of cases. Splenic hematoma with the hemoperineum, 29% of cases. With hemangiosarcoma, in 75% of such cases, the hemangiosarcoma lesion is the source of the hemorrhage with hemoabdomen cases. Just for, as a side note, the term hemoabdomen is what we typically will use, although technically speaking, if you're respecting the anatomy, hemoperineum is the, the appropriate word. It's blood-filled perineal, perineal cavity um, as opposed to the abdominal cavity, which would be uh, um, including the perineal layers. But it's, it's semantics. Um, a lot of the internists will stick with hemoperineum when they're performing ultrasounds and writing those ultrasound reports for the surgeon. I did want to make sure we were aware there were other cancers. There's a long list of other malignancies that can affect the spleen. So these are typically seen in 22 to 43% of cases, but hemangiosarcoma, of course, is the most commonly seen cancer. So hemangiosarcoma will be, will be our, our primary focus, um, and uh, it's a malignancy of vascular endothelial origin that results in widespread metastatic disease and, of course, survival in dogs. There's a ton of primary sites. Of course, the spleen is the most common primary site, and there's a ton of metastatic sites. Liver is the most common, followed by omentum, followed by mesentery in terms of, of uh, incidence. And those of us who have, who have performed surgery and worked up these cases for splenic hemangiosarcoma, we're, in, we're no stranger to that. If you see there with the metastatic hemangiosarcoma, we have heart as the fourth. It's about 9% incidence of cardiac involvement. And so the question of whether or not a cardiac workup is indicated in these cases, it kind of depends. It is not that high of a rate, but of course it's devastating if you are performing a splenectomy in a dog that has also cardiac mets because a, a, a cardiac mass may not show up on your standard three view thoracic radiographs for a metastatic screening. And um, an, ideally an echocardiogram is the way to go, but most facilities will not have access to an echocardiogram. 
especially in the middle of the night with a, a, a critical hemoabdomen and you're trying to rush into surgery, it's just not a luxury that a lot of us have. So thankfully it's only 9%, but it's not 0%. So we have to be aware of it. And it really basically what I'm saying is a discussion with a pet owner so they understand this is, is essential. Once the splenic mass ruptures, this is just a small list of the sequela that causes these patients to be more critical. Decreased um, oxygen transport is affected due to a decreased circulatory red blood cell volume. You have an exercise-induced systemic oxidative stress, which increases circulating hematopoietic stem and progenitor cell production, restrictive lung disease, anemia, DIC. Uh, DIC is actually seen in 12% of solid malignant tumors and is an increased rate with hemangiosarcoma. So these are just some of the many, many reason, reasons why these patients show up critical to the hospital. Obviously, this goes a bit beyond this, the scope of this talk, but just you know, be aware that, that a hindrance to oxygen transport is a massive reason why these pets are struggling preoperatively. When you look at trying to stage this disease based on the World Health Organization's parameters, um, stage one, two, and three are what we typically will delineate. Most of us in practice don't really gauge it this way, but the reason why these stages matter is because stage is correlated with prognosis long-term. Stage one, localized disease with only the primary tumor. Stage two, there's primary tumor with lymph node involvement or it's ruptured, so hemoabdomen, hemoperitoneum. Stage three, you've got the splenic rupture or lymph node involvement plus metastatic disease. On the right there, you can see there's a table for the TNM um, uh, um, criteria for these dogs. And so you can you can read that as well. That's another way of describing the different stages for hemangiosarcoma. The, this TNM categorization is used with a lot of cancers, not just hemangiosarcoma. It's not unique to, to that. So more importantly, it's the staging, and that's clinically how you can interpret the what stage that patient is in. Let's move on to signalment. And those of us uh, who are watching who are veterinarians are, are, are well aware of this. Um, although there's a wide age range of dogs that are affected with splenic masses, the mean age is 10 years. So I tell pet owners when they ask me about anesthesia in an older dog with this condition is what's the risk involved? To me, the risk is equal across the board in terms of age as it relates to anesthetic risk, because this is typically not a young dog disease, right? This is typically a middle aged to older dog disease. And so they're all the same playing field. They're all at risk of anesthesia. It's just a matter of individual biology, how critical the patient is, comorbidities, what your blood work is showing, et cetera. So they're all, they're all going to be older, older dogs. Golden Retrievers, German Shepherds, of course, are the, the main, main culprits here, but any, any uh, uh, large breed, extra large breed dog can be affected by this. And there is a, a slight uh, predisposition towards males as opposed to females. Clinical signs, we are all familiar with this as well. The um, I have had dogs that when you investigate further into their history, the pet owner will, will go into a more kind of long-term chronicity of clinical signs. And my belief is that some of these dogs that are developing splenic masses, benign or malignant, doesn't matter. If they occasionally have a, a bleed, the pet is clinical, and then the body stops the bleed, the pet is good again. And so if you investigate these pet owners, pet owners more thoroughly, going into the to history beyond just the acute or paracute, you'll find that there was actually some fluctuating symptoms or clinical signs rather for that dog for, for months preceding the presentation of a hemoabdomen. But in general, clinical signs are weakness, lethargy, abdominal distension, tachycardia, tachypnea, uh, pale mucous membranes, weight loss, collapse, and those pictures are, are pretty pretty classic for a dog showing up with a uh, hemoperitoneum. Keep in mind, again, our discussion here is, is focusing on splenic masses. We're not talking about other causes of visceral hemoperitoneum, like uh, an adrenal gland tumor that ruptured or a liver mass that's ruptured. And we're not talking about things like coagulopathies from um, uh, everything from hemophilia to rodenticide toxicity or trauma, we're focusing purely on splenic masses. So this discussion is, is focused on that. But I don't want the audience to think that only splenic masses cause hemoperitoneum. That's not the case. There's many differentials, but the but a common one is, is, is splenic masses.
On your diagnostics for a CBC, typically what you're what you're going to find is a low platelet count, high white blood cell count, and the high white blood cell count is characterized by a neutrophilia, and then of course anemia as well. The anemia is typically non-regenerative. You may see nucleated red blood cells. You may see schistocytes on on uh, on the blood panels, but these are just uh, some of the things you're going to find here. Um, you may think, well, if the dog is thrombocytopenic, do you want to take them to surgery? Well, the answer is yes. Because if you think about the, the broad causes of thrombocytopenia, this is likely, in this case, going to be a loss of platelets as opposed to a bone marrow issue or an immune-mediated thrombocytopenia issue or a sequestration issue, although it could be sequestration into the spleen, but most often it's going to be the fourth reason, which is going to be loss of platelets. And, uh, and so these dogs are not are typically, although they can be coagulopathic, the thrombocytopenia is necessarily a cause of their coagulopathy, at least to the point where you have to postpone surgery or, or not perform surgery on them. But again, you can have coagulopathic dogs, and so you're looking for other reasons why they might be quite other signs of coagulopathy, not just low platelets. And at the end of the day, you don't really have a choice. If there's life-threatening internal bleeding, then you need to take action if you're going to try and save that pet's life. Radiographs. Don't forget our MET checks, three view thoracic radiographs are imperative for, uh, for the work up on these dogs. You're looking for um, uh, any changes to the cardiac silhouette. Let's say, for example, if you have a, a pericardial effusion, a pericardial tamponade from a metastatic lesion to the heart, you're looking for that effusion. Could be either cancerous malignant, malignant effusion or it could be uh, a general inflammatory response or it could be from a coagulopathy as well. Um, the picture, the radiograph on the bottom of the screen with the yellow arrows is supposed to depict pleural fissure lines. So the pleura is filled with fluid and it's in between the lungs, of course. And so those are the lines you're looking for for uh, pleural fusion. You may or may not see lymphadenopathy, either sternal or uh, perichorinal lymphadenopathy. And then, of course, you're looking for mets to the lungs, to the spine, you know, all the, the, the organs that you can see there on your thoracic radiographs. Abdominal radiographs, very useful. Uh, there's the radiograph there with a uh, homogeneously enlarged spleen. Could that be liver? Sure, it could be It could be kidney, adrenal gland, pancreas, small intestine, lymph node. There's a variety of organs that, in, that, in that location of the abdomen. But typically speaking, if you're seeing a soft tissue mass effect on the cranial ventral portion of the abdomen, um, it's most likely going to be spleen, but keep in mind there are other masses that could that could be in that location, or other organs that could be infiltrated by a mass in that location. And then ultrasound can vary what it looks like. Typically, a targeted lesion is what is what the ultrasonographer is, is looking for for classic hemangiosarcoma. But for example, a, a splenic lymphoma can have that more model type appearance to it. For example, so the ultrasound is imperative not just for characterizing the spleen and the splenic mass or masses, but you're also looking for metastatic disease, especially in liver omentum mesentery. Final aspiration and cytology is a okay way of trying to diagnose splenic masses. I'm sure internal medicine doctors would disagree. I often will have, um, if FNA is performed before I get a hold of the case, Typically, it's coming back as extramedullary hematopoiesis or peripheral blood, and I don't really know if I can believe that. Um, and of course, there's a risk of, of iatrogenic hemoabdomen from final aspiration, but you can consider that as a minimally invasive way of diagnose, trying to diagnose this. Otherwise, uh, if you're going to you have the luxury of CT scan and MRI available to you, and the patient is a stable um, splenic mass, not an not active hemoabdomen, then sure, you can characterize the spleen further using those diagnostics. But by far, we're talking about radiographs here and if you have available abdominal ultrasound. Exploratory laparotomy is the way to go, uh, obviously for confirming the diagnosis, but also for treating the problem. And then histopathology confirms it as well. Another talking point here that I want to stress is with histopathology, the liver needs to be biopsied. It, to me, it doesn't matter if the liver looks normal on radiographs and ultrasound and grossly in surgery. Liver biopsy is mandatory, at least one lobe. If you see a lesion on the liver and you can safely access it without causing a problem, certainly you want to biopsy the, the lesion. But if the liver looks normal on gross inspection at the time of ciliotomy, collect a biopsy. It's, it's such a high metastatic rate, and it's number one location is liver. You're obligated to, um, to um, 
biopsy the liver. The um, image up top there with the red arrow is, is showing a uh, vertebral mass compressing on the spinal cord. Obviously, there could be other causes for vertebral masses, but hemangiosarcoma does, does just to remind folks that it does uh, spread there. I have had cases that have spread to the, uh, to the vertebral canal. But most of us are not performing 3D uh, imaging, right? Advanced imaging for these. It, it's just, I'm just making sure that you have kind of a general overview of this. Here's a CAT scan um, on slide A or picture A there. The arrows are showing the spleen. It's enlarged. It's got a cavitated mass associated with it. And then slide B is, is suggesting that there's a metastatic lesion in the, in, the, in the lung there on CT scan. Stabilization, of course, is a whole other topic all on its own. So we won't go into crazy detail. Any questions you have, I'm happy to try and tackle them as a surgeon. Um, usually the surgeons are responsible for the stabilizing of the patient, but if you're fortunate enough to have an emergency critical care specialist on hand, great. Otherwise, uh, your typical measures of fluid resuscitation and trying to stabilize them hemodynamically, you want to have two large bore catheters in these dogs, ideally, and then the access to blood products, um, um, whether it's whole blood, packed red blood cells, whatever it is you have access to, depending on your preference as a clinician and what the patient needs but some sort of um, um, way to manage their cardiovascular collapse. Otherwise, co other colloids like head of starch are, are, can be used as well, but keeping in mind, of course, that doesn't fix the anemia problem. That's purely a vascular expansion. The picture there at the bottom with the glove um, is trocarization of the, of the stomach. And yes, you can do that, of course. Um, I find that with how big the stomach gets, that this this procedure to try and therapeutically release the pressure from the distended abdomen, which is compressing the vena cava and the liver, all that stuff. Um, I don't know how useful it is, but there are definitely, and I'm sure folks who are listening and watching this, they've stabilized patients or it's helped them stabilize patients by trocarizing them. I've never done it myself because by the time I'm involved with the case, my goal is to get them under anesthesia, pass an orogastric tube. Um, on the way to the operating room and then and then from there performing the surgery. But it is a viable option um, that can save lives, of course, especially if that's your your only your only chance the patient's declining despite your best efforts and you're still waiting for the surgeon to arrive or the client is still trying to make a decision and you want to maximize the stability of this patient, it's certainly a viable option. These are all different types of surgical procedures associated with the spleen. We're going to focus, of course, on splenectomy. Um, but don't forget liver biopsying these patients. Prophylactic gastropexy is interesting because the same dogs that, that suffer from a splenic mass are the same ones that suffer from GDV. And GDV is typically a middle age to older dog disease. Um, and, uh, and whether or not you perform a gastropexy at the time of surgery, I don't know. It involves communicating with the pet owner. The way I usually will phrase it is, is typically if the patient's stability warrants me being able to gastropexy them, I will do it. Otherwise, a patient's life comes first and not preventing a GDV later on, especially when you talk about, you know, maybe maybe a month to three months survival with hemangiosarcoma, where the chances will have a GDV in that, in that time frame. We don't really know, but there there are studies that suggest that these that the gastric um uh, mobility in these dogs after removing the spleen is higher and therefore there's a risk of GDV post-operatively, so you can make both arguments. My my discussion with the pet owner is if the patient is stable enough, I'll perform it. If not, we're going to abandon that ship and just focus on the problem at hand. Other biopsies I put in there because you'll, you know, you'll have a dog that comes in for a splenic mass, hemoperitoneum, needs an emergency surgery, and the owner is like, oh, by the way, uh, she has a mammary gland tumor. It's been there forever. Can you remove it? She's got a lipoma. Can you remove it while you're doing it? Can you perform a dental <laughs> while you're doing it? And it's the same conversation with the gastropexy. It's going to be a, a low priority. If I have the luxury of doing it, sure, I'll do it. Otherwise, the patient's life comes first. But just letting you know, you'll be faced with those decisions. If you have a dog that's got bladder stones at the time of the splenic mass diagnosis and needs emergency surgery, do you perform a cystotomy at the same time? Depends. You have, to, you have to talk to the pet owner about pros and cons of that and what you feel comfortable as a surgeon. And then, of course, other comorbidities, these are older dogs, right? So they have arthritis, they have diabetes, hypothyroidism. There's just other conditions that they may be suffering from that impacts the, uh, the case itself and the owner's decision-making.
On the bottom right there is a drawing of performing a liver biopsy. There are a number of ways of performing a liver biopsy and uh, you know wh whatever technique you wanna use is, is fine with me. Um, this is showing at the top there is repairing like a splenic laceration, let's say. So, it's, you know, the, I, I've, I don't think I've ever even performed one. It's just not a common thing. Um, I suppose the most common reason for doing this is if you're entering the abdomen and your scalpel blade accidentally hits the spleen, then that's a reason for that. Otherwise, to see an isolated splenic laceration from like, like external trauma hit by a car or whatever, I'm, I haven't seen it. And then the, the, the bottom picture there, the bottom drawing shows a partial splenectomy, which brings me to my next talking point. That is never, ever, ever, ever perform a partial splenectomy in dogs unless you're absolutely certain the reason why you're, you're removing a part of the spleen is because it was, it was known to be traumatized by, let's say, for example, an intra-abdominal herniation and the spleen became entrapped and that part of the spleen lost its vascular supply, then maybe you can argue that a partial splenectomy is the way to go. But essentially, because the, the because at least three quarters of dogs with splenic lesions are going to have malignancy, it behooves you ethically to remove the entire spleen. Dogs don't need their entire spleen or even a portion of their spleen for longevity, whereas in people, they become severely immunocompromised without a spleen, and so they will try to salvage uh, a portion of your spleen as a person, even with, with cancer, but the incidence of malignancy in people is lower than it is in dogs. And so never, ever, ever, ever will you perform a partial splenectomy um, in general, uh, especially this with splenic mass. And um, in the rare case you have splenic trauma, you can make the argument for that. But um, I have never performed a partial splenectomy. It's always been a, a total splenectomy that I, that I have performed. But keep that in mind. Because um, it's tempting, right? Because you have an isolated, uh, small splenic mass at the tail end of the spleen, easily accessible. I can just knock that thing out and save the rest of the spleen. Do not do it. Submit the remove the entire spleen and submit the entire spleen for biopsy. These are just different ways of performing any vascular surgery, splenectomy or otherwise, depending on what you have access to. You can use uh, the, 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 the ligature device, which is the, the very top uh, middle gun there, is, um, is my favorite. There's a, the one on the left is a smaller size up top, like top row there. But um, I love ligature. It's fantastic. It's like Pac-Man. It just goes right through the vascular supply. There are sometimes vessels that are too big for the ligature, in which case you want to ligate with sutures. Or in general, we just want to make sure that you have the most secure, the main splenic artery and vein, you want to use uh, suture for that. Otherwise, various um, uh, techniques can be used depending on your skill set and your experience, what you have access to. So outcome with hemangiosarcoma. The stage one dogs, you're looking at about 151 day mean survival time. Stage two, 107. Stage three, 73. And you can see stage three, there's a range there. Um, so SAGE matters in terms of post-operative long-term survival in these dogs, the SAGE matters. SAGE 1 plus 2 dogs, this is, not a, this is just, this is just um, cohorts, this is not a dog that has both stages. 50 to 75% within, eight, within 86 days survival, one year survival is 6%. I'm surprised that one year survival is even that high, but... Um, I've had dogs that were supposedly diagnosed with splenic hemangiosarcoma that have come to me <laughs> years later, which, you know, then you kind of question the initial diagnosis because um, um, it can be a bit tricky to diagnose this. Benign disease survival, you're looking at uh, 650 days with a one-year survival of 85%, three-year 45%, six-year 30%. Those numbers make sense. Malignancy in general, 85-day uh, survival, one-year 20%, three-year 10%. That's malignancy of any of any kind, not just hemangiosarcoma. The hemangiosarcoma cases have a 30% um, of cases that survive two months, 7% one year. Hemangiosarcoma with surgery alone, median of 86 days versus chemotherapy, that can pretty much double it. Um, and so, you know, whether or not that's worth it to that pet owner, it depends. It depends on that pet owner. They have the finances where they add emotionally with this. They want to put the dogs through chemo. It warrants at least an oncology consultation and talk about pros and cons of chemotherapy. But chemotherapy can potentially double their survival time. Hematoma survival, 85% two months, 65% one year, overall survival 338 days. I don't want to give the impression that hematoma Splenic hematoma dogs die from the hematoma later on. They probably are dying from other diseases that they have as older dogs um, or just, you know, you know, geriatric, just old age. 
but um, these are the numbers that we that we have. Postoperative complications. So um, I have a list of these in your notes. I want to touch on the um, VPCs, ventricular premature contractions there. And uh, that's probably one of the more common ones that I'll see postoperatively. You can see a pre-op, intra-op, or post-op to varying the degrees all the way to in the bottom there, VTAC, ventricular tachycardia. And there are met ways to medically manage this. I'm happy to talk about more specifics if, if the audience is interested in that. Um, on my familiarity with it, with treating arrhythmias is lidocaine and procainamide. That's where I usually go. But um, if you have the opportunity for an internal medicine specialist in your facility or an emergency critical care specialist, it's always good to run it by them and see what they think um, in terms of interpreting the ECG and how to how to manage any any arrhythmias. But of course, with such a, a, a severe diffuse cardiovascular disease like hemoabdomen, hemoparentineum, there's a variety of different of different um, sequela to it for for uh, for these dogs. So acid base and electrolyte imbalances, um, hypoxemia or ischemia to the heart due to poor venous return and being in shock, the large mass size that we mentioned earlier, obstructs the caudal vena cava, decreases venous return, microembolic disease from being coagulopathic, perhaps there are cardiac depressant factors from ischemia to nearby organs or from the hypovolemia itself. And then how much if, of these complications are due to, to us as doctors manipulating the spleen? Um, I I um, very careful not just not just when I'm manipulating the spleen to not cause further splenic rupture because these tissues can be friable, but also how much manipul how much manipulation can I get away with to remove the spleen, but also not necessarily test the body and release depressant factors or cause further debilitation to the heart, causing arrhythmias. Splenic torsion I only mention it here because I've seen splenic torsion and whether or not. Um, the spine torsion caused the hemoabdomen or or if it was a, a, a primary or it was a secondary condition due to a large spleen that was more mobile and, and then a blood-filled cavity, I don't know. But my point with the splenic torsion is you're not going to untors it. Do not untors it. The second you untors the spleen, um, it's going to release all of these radicals, uh, oxidative radicals, and cause uh, arrhythmia and um, um, diffuse microembolic disease. It's... It's horrific. And so splenic torsion, you're going to remove the, the spleen at the base of the pedicle where it's torsed, trying to keep in mind of the blood supply to nearby viscera. This is where it matters. They need to make sure that the pancreas and stomach are, are, are going to be okay. But do not do not untors the spleen. This is very, very, very rare to see splenic torsion in general. But just in case, I don't want folks to untors, to detours the spleen. Predictive factors. These are predictive factors that will dictate whether or not the dog has hemangiosarcoma. So um, typically hypoproteinemia, thrombocytopenia, having abnormal red blood cell morphology and having hemoparentineum are associated with a higher risk of being diagnosed with hemangiosarcoma. The um, mean mass to splenic volume ratio is higher in benign diseases versus other malignancies, and especially compared to hemangiosarcoma, you can see the numbers, the numbers there. Benign splenic masses tend to have a higher mean splenic weight as a percentage of as a percentage of body weight versus hemangiosarcoma. And these are not going to be, of course, foolproof, right? But these are things to help a client decide where where they want to go with this with this case. Prognostic factors, inter interestingly enough, older age may increase survival. Um, another prognostic factor is how bad the anemia is. That will also affect mortality. The number of lesions. Uh, present if they have more than one, no dogs are alive by one year of age. Versus if they have one lesion, sixteen percent are alive at one year. The stage of the dog we mentioned already. Having high neutrophil count and low platelets is associated with DIC. And then of course anything that's affecting the respiratory tract, like uh, ARDS or pulmonary thromboembolism, increases death substantially. These are all factors that in influence prognosis. Having bicavitaria effusion increases the death rate. Having tachycardia usually means you need a blood transfusion, which then usually means there's a higher chance of dying from the, from the condition. Hyperlactatemia preoperatively is a negative prognostic factor. Having VPCs, splenic torsion um, are negative prognostic factors. The spleen being a source of bleeding is a positive factor, and that's probably because that's treatable. You can remove the spleen. 
Whereas, whereas you, if you have a, a hepatic mass that's hemorrhaging, you may not always be able to access that safely and remove it safely. Then we will finish up here by talking about monitoring, because I believe that the success of surgery is dependent on the patient's biology and their circumstances, comorbidities, how critical they are, how great your team is, your diagnostic tools, but then monitoring. Monitoring is massive. Um, and, and the most common um, uh, confusion that I see with general practitioners who want to perform splenectomy is, is how do they monitor postoperatively? And it's usually a lot less than when I would consider as a surgeon to be ideal. Monitoring, of course, can be manual. So, you know, using a human being, it, there's some sub subjectivity to that, whether you're looking at something, hearing something, feeling something, it's, it's, a, it's a bit less objective than using devices. And if you can have a device that will monitor a patient more remotely, meaning minimize stress to the patient, minimizing um, the uh, workload of your team, that's even better. And so, um, I'm very uh, happy to talk about Vet Guardian, which is a, a, a contactless, contactless device to help monitor critical patients. This can be used for patients that are stable, you know, elective splenectomies as well, but it especially shines when you're talking about those patients that are quite critical. And if, you meet, if you're talking about an older pet who's really debilitated from being in shock and then undergoing um, surgery, anesthesia, having a tough post-operative recovery, this is great, minimally manipulating the patient and trying to maximize the diagnostic value. So vital measurements are going to be attained with this, with this diagnostic tool, body temperature, pulse rate, respiratory rate, um, movement of the, of the patient, and then um, using uh, Doppler radar and thermal imager, imagery, they, it, can, it can try and detect uh, warning signs of impending um, cardiovascular and, and pulmonary issues with these, with these patients. It's continuous. So one of the biggest um, downfalls to spot checking with electrocardiogram and ECG is that you could miss a heart arrhythmia. If you're performing an ECG for 30 seconds, a minute, maybe five minutes, maybe, you're still missing hours and hours and hours between your next ECG measurement, whereas continuous is, is really mandatory to catch any and all arrhythmias that, that you can. And then of course the device will send alerts out as, as well and it stores all the data. Um, so it's, it's very cool. And that's a the top right is a picture, not only of a dog that's being monitored with Vet Guardian, but at the very top you can see patients being monitored simultaneously using the device. And so you can have a, a, nice, a nice query of, of patients that are being monitored. So it benefits not just your staff from having to do less work in terms of um, in terms of attaching a blood pressure machine or an ECG machine, checking a pulse ox, and then of course the pet benefits by less interaction with the staff, so they need to rest from the procedure. Plus, if you have a patient that's being affected by cardiac arrhythmias, they are more likely, even if you take them for a basic walk, prone to collapsing. Um, you're stressing out the cardiovascular system, and the problem with VPCs and other arrhythmias is that you have inadequate filling of the heart, inadequate perfusion. And so they just can't handle that. So if you can, if you can monitor them with less manipulation, it's better for the patient. The clients, of course, benefit from this, the practice benefits from it. Telediagnostics really are the future. Um, having, having created vet triage and, and been in the telehealth space for almost five years now, um, telediagnostics are the way to go. And we all know this for those of us who manage diabetics, for example, they these blood sugar levels are monitored at home and telediagnostics like Vet Guardian are are, are there it's the future it's already here it's already here and it's, it, the the potential for this is is going to be um, is massive so so yeah this is just a, um, a depiction of 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 the cool technology that this device uses here's a close up of the diagnostics uh, the, the diagnostic results of it um, and here's it's showing on different devices as well pretty cool. So um, yeah, so I, I, I can't speak highly enough. I, I and, and not just for hemoglobin, but for other diseases as well that you're worried about um, manipulating the patient or pet patient uh, anxiety. Respiratory cases are great for this. You know, if you can monitor the patient with, 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 without continuously opening the oxygen cage to assess them, it's, it's very beneficial.
So key points I want to make here to wrap up and then any questions folks have, uh, keep in mind your proceedings are based on splenic mass literature, which can be very difficult to interpret. I try my best to consolidate things so you can at least have something to use for uh, uh, for client communication clinically. Client, client communication is massive for this disease because of comorbidities, because of adjunctive procedures you may want to perform, um, you know, uh, like gastropexy or cystotomy or whatever. You need to tell the clients, like, we got to prioritize these procedures. And um, they have to also be aware of the risk of cancer with these dogs and the risk of postoperative complications. So, and all this has to be done in conjunction with what's, what's their financial capabilities, and what's the, the the viewpoint on quality of life? It's part of spectrum of care. Talk to the client about where they're at, emotionally, financially, all the things before they commit to, to a procedure like, like this. Don't forget, always, always, always submit the spleen for histopathology. I don't, it doesn't matter to me how benign it looks, grossly or on ultrasound, you wanna biopsy the spleen. You're gonna biopsy liver for staging purposes as well, regardless of what the liver looks like. Concurrent surgical procedures we already talked about, and then postoperative care. Vet guardian takes care of a lot of this stuff, but don't forget PCV checks and pain management with these dogs. Walking is interesting because it, it ties into what I was talking about before with risking patient collapse. These are older dogs that are, have cardiovascular compromise, and so you want them to walk outside to hopefully urinate and defecate, but you got to be careful. So I frequently will have the staff gurney the dog outside, put them on the ground let them do their thing, put them back in the gurney, and then gurney them back to ICU. That way, they're only walking for the time that they need to urinate and defecate, and then and we're not stressing them beyond that. 